in defining spatial weights matrices, we've said that they're matrices that record spatial relationships. And in particular, we've said that spatial relationships are recorded here by noting who is a neighbor of who. In a way that if you're a neighbor of somebody, you will get a non-negative and non-zero value in that cell of the matrix. And if you're not, you will get a zero uh, weight in the matrix. Of course, the question that bears this definition is, what is a neighbor? And it turns out that depending on how you define that, uh, how do you answer that question, you can have several types of spatial weights matrices. That's what we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail in this video. Let's have a look at the slides. The question we're trying to answer here is, what is a neighbor? And as it turns out, there isn't a single answer for this. A neighbor can be defined following many, many rules or following many criteria. In general terminology, a neighbor is somebody who lives next door or is also somebody we would use the word neighbor to describe someone or something that is located nearby us. So, so in other words, that is close to us or in a short distance. But also, in other contexts, we may use or refer to neighbors as somebody from the same place. You might say a neighbor is somebody who lives in the same um, part of town of you, or in the same county, or in the same ward. Even though those relationships are not mediated through distance necessarily. As it turns out, each of these definitions, whether it's next door or nearby in terms of distance, or within the same uh, entity or geographical entity, are going to give rise to different definitions of spatial weight matrices that will allow us to translate geography into specific um, representations in a spatial weight matrix. So let's see. Let's have a look a little bit more into each of them. If we assume that a neighbor is somebody who lives next door, then we will use or we will be thinking in terms of what we will call contiguity-based matrices. If we're going for a distance-based um, definition, so we're considering that a neighbor is somebody who lives close by or is nearby, and implicit in that close by and nearby is that it's a shorter distance than when compared to other observations, then we will be uh, looking to build distance-based matrices. And finally, if we go for um, a definition that is more based on place rather than on space or geography, then we will be looking into block weights. So let's have a look into each of these three, contiguity, distance, and block weights, to see what they are and how we can build them. And just a note, if you're interested in these and you want to get a bit more detail, the chapter, there's a couple of chapters on the Anselin and Ray 2014 book that are very, very detailed. And, and it's not necessarily the most straightforward and, and beginner ready uh, covering of weights, but it's one of the most comprehensive ones that I've come across. So if you're interested, that's a really good place to, to go next. Contiguity based weights relate to the notion of neighborhood that we were talking about first. This idea that somebody is a neighbor of somebody if they live next door. Implicitly, in more technical terms, when we're saying next door, what we're saying is that the, the other observation or the other person is a topological neighbor, which in this context means that um, when we're discussing polygons, two polygons are neighbors when they share, to some extent, the boundaries. And this sharing of boundary could be based on a single point, or could be based on an edge, which is to say at least two points and maybe more than two. Or it could be um, on other definitions. Whichever one we we use, whether it's a single, uh, whether the two polygons need to share only one point to be considered neighbors or an edge to be considered neighbors, um, once we assume that two observations are neighbors, we're going to assign a weight of typically one at least initially. And if two observations are not uh, considered neighbors, then we're going to assign a weight of zero. Let's see an example to clarify this. Here we have a, a 
polygon geography where there's several polygons and for this example we're focusing on the polygon colored in red following a contiguity based uh, criterion for building the weights or for defining spatial relationships every polygon colored in red would be considered uh, a neighbor of the red polygon because each of these polygons shares some part of their boundary with the red polygon. By contrast, every polygon colored in gray is considered not a neighbor because there's no boundary sharing between the red polygon and each of the gray polygons. Now, when we're thinking of how this would translate into the spatial weights matrix, remember it's a matrix, then we would have a row for the red polygon and in that row, we will have a value of one for every column representing each of the polygons in red and a zero for every polygon, for every column representing each polygon colored in gray. That's on if we follow a contiguity based approach. Another way we've discussed of defining neighborhood is based on distance. And here we're following the idea that a neighbor is somebody or something which is or who is located nearby. Implicit in nearby is that there is a short distance. The idea when we're thinking of spatial weights matrices here is that we're assigning the weight, so we're defining first whether there is a neighbor or not, so whether the weight is zero or more than zero, and how much that more than zero weight is based or proportional to the distance between the two observations. So if we have two observations, the weight that we will assign to the uh, cell in the matrix that crosses the row representing one observation and the column representing the other one is going to be proportional to the distance. And typically we will um, actually assign a value that is inversely proportional in the sense that we will typically give more weight to observations with a short or small distance and a smaller weight for observations that are located on a larger distance. Now, exactly which value we, we do may vary, and there's a lot of criteria. We'll see more, uh, you will see more when you move on to the Hanson section of the course uh, in which we will treat a couple, a couple options. We can, for example, uh, use an inverse distance and just say the weight that we're going to assign everyone is a neighbor of everyone and the weight that we're going to assign is um, simply the inverse of the distance so that one divided by the distance between the two observations or we can also be a bit more exclusive and apply a threshold and say for example everyone which is within 500 meters of an observation is considered a neighbor and then we can say for those within 500 meters or whichever threshold, we will give a value, a weight of one. Everyone else will get a weight of zero. And in this case, we will be creating a binary matrix, same as with the contiguity case. Or we could say, if you are within 500 meters or within a given threshold of distance, you will get a weight that is proportional or inversely proportional to the distance. If you're beyond 500 meters, you will get a, a weight of zero or whichever threshold, sorry. But the, trick, the, the key point here is that we're using distance directly to establish the relationship of neighbor, neighborhood or not. Another approach is the so-called KNN uh, algorithm or KNN um, approach. KNN stands for K nearest neighbors, where K is an, an arbitrary value. The idea here is that you want to define neighbors based on distance, but which specific distance doesn't matter as much as whether that distance is in is the shortest or the k shortest uh, distance within everyone else in the in the geography. So, for example, if you use k equals five, so five nearest neighbor, for every observation, the neighbors of that observation under this criterion will be the five nearest observations, whichever their distance, because what matters is that once you've calculated all of the distances, those are the nearest ones. Let's see a graphic example of this case. Here we have the same geography as before. The same We're focusing on the same polygon, which we color in red. Uh, 
And now because polygons uh, are two-dimensional entities, we're going to calculate distances based on centroid. So this is what we, a centroid is the, the geographic equivalent of an average or a mean. So it gives us a, a measure of the, the center point of a given polygon. So every blue dot, we have a blue dot for every polygon in this geography, and it's notifying us of, the, of its centroid. We're going to use these centroids to calculate distances between each pair of polygons. And in particular, for this example, between the polygon we're interested in, the red polygon, and every other polygon in the geography. The yellow circle signifies a threshold that we've uh, established. Let's assume that this is 500 meters. And then we are saying we're going here with a um, this inverse distance uh, weight, so not a k nearest neighbors. In this case, what we're doing is saying if the centroid of a given polygon is within 500 meters or the radius that we've established of the centroid of the polygon we're interested in, then we're considering those polygons a neighbor. And if they're not, they will not. And what results from this analysis is what you see in the, in the map here, that every polygon colored in green has their centroid within the threshold, and hence they are considered a neighbor and colored green. And every other polygon, which is colored as gray, has their centroid outside the threshold radius, outside the uh, yellow circle, and hence they're not considered neighbors. Now, when we're thinking about how we translate this into the spatial weights matrix, we will have a row for, same as before, we will have a row for the red polygon, and for every column that represents each of the green polygons here, we're going to have a non-zero value, a non-zero weight. And if it's a binary weights matrix that we're creating, that will be a one. And if it's not, if it's a continuous matrix, then that could be, for example, the inverse of the distance. So the distance between uh, the centroid of a polygon and the centroid of our polygon of interest, and then that inverted. So one over one divided by that distance, for example. Now, the interesting thing that we can see here when we bring the two as an illustration is that even though the geography is exactly the same, the way we encapsulate that geography into a spatial weights matrix varies. And this is critical because when we move on to using spatial weights matrices for um, more sophisticated analysis or more advanced statistics, everything the statistic or the method is going to, to know about the geography is whatever is encapsulated in the matrix. So it's interesting to recognize that different criteria are going to yield ex slightly or non-slightly different matrices. Just with this example, we can see how for this polygon colored in red, when we look at contiguity, we have a set of polygons colored in green that are defined as neighbors. When we look at the same polygon on the same geography, but we consider the distance criterion, the set of polygons that are considered neighbors is slightly different. So for example, this polygon here is considered a, a, a neighbor based on contiguity because there is some boundary shared. However, when we look at distance, because its center is slightly outside of the radius, is not considered a neighbor. Conversely, this polygon here, it's a small polygon and it's relatively close because of the shape of this other polygon. Its centroid happens to fall within the radius, hence under the distance-based matrix is considered, or the distance-based criterion, sorry, is considered a neighbor in the contiguity case because there is another polygon in between the two and hence there's no boundary sharing is not considered. So we're seeing, as an, even with this simple illustration, that how we encode a geography into a matrix, even if the geography is the same, is going to vary slightly depending on the criterion. And then the final example that we're going to see is what we, what we termed block weights. 
this is cases where we're defining neighbors based not exactly on geography or not topologically on geography, but on definitions or membership definitions that we use, which may be based on geography. For example, uh, local authorities into the country or counties into a state or states into a country. These are all geographical definitions, but they are also administrative definitions. So they, they follow loosely geography, but they're really a definition that an agency has uh, decided that that, that that is that particular way. Another example might be postcodes within city boundaries. A postcode is assigned into a city boundary, um, but it doesn't always follow either a, a strictly distance-based criterion or a contiguity. Um, let's see the example. This is the case for um, the MSOA, so census geographies in, in the UK or in England and Wales at least, follow a hierarchy of geographies. And almost at the bottom is something called the lower super output area, is a definition that we're seeing here in the polygon. So each of these polygons is one of the census geographies named LSOAs, lower super output areas. These LSOAs are hierarchically aggregated into middle output areas or MSOAs, which is to say that an MSOA is a group of uh, LSOAs. But how LSOAs are grouped into MSOAs really depends on the Office of National Statistics. And it follows geography, but not exactly uh, into a distance-based or a contiguity-based criterion all the time. So what we see here is that the LSOA represented by the red polygon, which is the exact same that we've been looking at before, is part of an MSOA that also contains these other polygons colored in green. Now, these polygons are nearby. Some of them are contiguous, but not all of them. And it's a different geography that is entirely decided by, in this case, the Office of National Statistics. So to build these weights, what you need is the list of memberships of who is part of each of the aggregations. And what we're doing here in terms of translating that geography or that aspect of geography into um, a spatial weights matrix is we're saying for every, in, in the row that represents a polygon, say in, in the row for the red polygon here, we're going to assign a one for every polygon colored in green, regardless of the other relationships that they meet, or not, and then we're going to assign a weight of zero to everyone else, in this example to those assigned in gray. We've seen now three examples of how two polygons or two observations in a sample can be defined as a neighbor or not. Now, once you are once you decide that two observations are a neighbor or not, in some criteria, We've seen that that also implicitly decides the weight that we assign to that. And we've seen the case of binary weights where we say, if you're a neighbor, you get a weight of one. If you're not a neighbor, you get a weight of zero. But there is um, there are other options. So in this slide, uh, I want to go a little bit more in detail into what are some of those options. So the easy case is the non-neighbor Situation. So if a poly if an observation or a polygon is considered not to be a neighbor of another one, then the weight that is assigned to that is zero. And in the in math notation, we express this as the Wij, so the cell in the W matrix where the row corresponds to the observation I and the column to the observation J, which is just to say of two observations that are not the same. If they're not neighbors, this weight is zero. Now, where things get interesting is when we consider that observation I and observation J are a neighbor, and then we have to decide something that is greater than zero. And here's where we have a few options. So in the binary case, we've already said this Wij is going to be one, as notifying that Binary means that it's 
the, the weights matrix only contains zeros and ones, and zeros we've seen is for non-neighbors, so neighbors get a one. But we can get a bit more detailed in defining and a bit more fine grain with a bit more granularity to define the strength of that neighbor relationship. So we could say that you're a neighbor, but not as neighbor as somebody else, and then assign a smaller weight. Always greater than zero, but a smaller weight. And this is what we have here. We can assign some proportion that goes between zero and one. So the weight that we assign is greater than zero because we're still defining neighbors, but is less than one. So it's less than the totalist case of the binary criterion. And then that specific proportion can be a function of distance, as we've already seen, inverse distance, for example, or it can be a function of the strength of interaction that we define based on some other criterion. For example, we could look at how much two regions or two areas interact in terms of commuting, how many people travel between those two areas every day. And based on that flow of people, which is mediated through space, but it's also more sophisticated than simply being right next to each other or within a distant threshold, we define a weight. So you can see how you can start building weights very simply, assigning either zeros and ones, but you can already, you can very quickly build complexity and sophistication. And in some cases that might be needed, in some cases it might not. So to wrap up this, this clip, I wanted to end on a note about reflecting about which criteria might be better in, in a particular case. And the, the general rule, because we have seen quite a few ways of defining weights matrices, quite a few ways of assigning specific weights. So I want to end with an overview and, and an almost a, a cheat sheet, a, a list of tips on how you, you can decide weights. And because this is crucial, remember that the first thing I should say is that this is very important because this is how we are showing geography to the statistics and the methods that we will be doing later. So remember, the choice of W is critical. And the key guiding principle, in my opinion, is this one. You should base the choice. You should pick one criterion versus another one, one rule of defining weights over another one based on the underlying channels of interaction that you want to, to capture. Remember, the, weights the spatial weights matrix takes geography and spatial relationships with all of their complexity and turns them into a single value for every pair of observations. That is a massive simplification. But at the same time, it's a massive opportunity to distill which aspect of geography you think is going to be most important for the analysis you're, you're carrying out and then keeping only that, discarding everything else, which might have been noise for the analysis you're interested in. So the trick here is how can we align as much as possible the, the method of spatial interaction that we want to get at with our analysis and the criterion that we use for defining spatial weight matrix. Let me give you a couple of examples so hopefully I land this very abstract idea into something more concrete. Cases where, or if you're doing an analysis with data about um, a process or a phenomenon where you're interested in contagion or spread through individual interaction, where interaction, where, where physical interaction is required, for example, disease contagion is a great is a great case of these. If you're looking at data that looks at the spread of a disease over a, a given geography, and you know that that disease is spreads based on face-to-face uh, -face interaction, for example, you might want to use contiguity weights because they encode this idea of face-to-face -face interaction in the uh, notion that two observations need to share a boundary, need to be uh, nearby and contiguous to each other to be considered neighbors. If, by contrast, you're working on an accessibility analysis where we, what you're interested, where, where the aspect you're interested in of, the, of space or of geography is how many 
things, amenities, jobs, um, transport, um, bus stops, etc., you can access from the place where you live, then that suggests that it's not about being right next to something, it's about being able to cover the distance between where you are and that's something you're interested in. And, and that might lend itself a lot better into a distance-based approach. Or a third example here, if you're looking at um, the effects that some regulation, some law has on certain counties or certain, certain regions, certain words, maybe you might want to encode that by using a block-based block approach where you're saying, I'm going to consider as neighbors every region or every area which is within the same um, jurisdiction, whether it's a state, whether it's a county, whether it's a word, whether it's a region. And then finally, weights usually are post-processed once they're built before they're used. So we might have built a, a, a binary weight where we assign a, one, a, a weight of one to neighbors and a weight of zero to non-neighbors. But then before we use that, sometimes we might want to standardize those values. And there are um, certain cases we're going to definitely see some of those applications where standardization is very useful later in the course. For now, just keep in mind that in many cases it makes sense to post-process the weights and convert the way, the original way we've done into another one by a process of standardization. The most common here is what we will call row-based standardization. And the idea here is that if you can think of the matrix as made up of rows and columns, we're going to go row by row and divide every weight in that row by the total number of uh, neighbors. So if one uh, observation, one row has five neighbors, and then we're assuming that this is a binary weights, then we're going to take each of those weights of one and divide them by zero. Non-neighbors, we don't need to divide because zero divided by anything is zero this also. So it doesn't change. And that will ensure, which we'll see later why this is useful, that when we sum all of the weights of that row, we obtain a one. And that will come in handy later in the course.